All right. Well, Clint, are you ready to get started? Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's get started. Okay, guys, welcome webinar attendees. My name is Frank Cordero, and I'm the Associate Program Director for CG Master Academy. Today's webinar is going to be an exciting one indeed. We are excited to have our CGMA audience meet art director and senior environment artist, Clinton Crumpler. Holy smokes. He will be sharing some of his amazing insights on our webinar entitled Next Level Environment Art in Unreal, which is awesome. And I think he's so excited to present that. Now, I just want to let you guys know today that today's webinar is sponsored by CG Master Academy. And uh, CG Master Academy is a leader in online digital arts education in visual effects, games, and now animation. And it uh, looks like my screen share kind of got a little bit quit out, but that's okay. No big deal. Uh, all right. Um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, and just to kind of give you a heads up, guys, uh, we will, after the presentation, uh, we'll have a, a little bit short uh, Q&A today. Uh, to our participating audience in today's webinar, we collected some questions and we might work them in where we can. Um, and uh, so thanks in advance for participating in the webinar. Now, before we get started, guys, uh, I just wanted to share an important announcement to all of you about our exciting promotion for Clinton's class that may motivate some of you to sign up sooner rather than later. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and publish this on the chat so you guys can see. All right. So CG Master Academy is offering the first 15 students a 10% discount for enrolling in Clinton's amazing class using the offer code posted here. I'm revealing the offer in the chat area. And for those who want to take advantage of it, click on the offer button to start your enrollment using the offer code provided. Okay. So what was an already an amazing educational deal for Clinton's class is now even better with 10% off. And I just want to encourage you guys take advantage of this limited opportunity. Uh, they should go pretty quick. Um, speaking of Clinton, uh, let's do a little bit of bragging about one of our top instructors at CGMA. All right. Clinton is the founder and studio head and creative director of Decagon Studios, which is an artist collaborative outsourcing studio. Clinton is formerly a senior look development artist at the Coalition in Vancouver, which is part of Microsoft Studios and worked on the Gears of War franchise. Pretty damn awesome. His experience ranges from AAA games, indie and mobile development. So he's covering a lot of ground with his background and experience. Uh, in 2016, he released a textbook with Sam's Publishing with a focus on game art uh, and development for the Unreal Engine. Clinton's primary focuses are art direction, environment art, shaders, and visual development. And that's covering a lot of ground. That's a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience. And I'm so glad all you guys are here to be a little bit of a part of this. So I want everyone in the CGMA uh, audience to give uh, Clinton, all right, to art director, senior environment artist, and entrepreneur. You got to put that in there. Clinton <laughs> Crumpler, holy smokes. Congratulations. <laughs> awesome. So glad to have you here, man. How you doing? For sure. Yeah, yeah. Doing great, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right, man, considering. I mean, I got a little hot the last couple of days. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're, we're making the most of it and looking forward to maybe doing a little bit of uh, swimming in the pool this uh, weekend. But, um, you know. Hopefully it's uh, going to be somewhat equally fun or at least uh, something uh, where you can get out and enjoy the day. But uh, enough for that. Uh, everyone's waiting uh, for, for, for what you have to say. So we're so excited about your presentation. And um, the title of today's webinar is Next Level Environment Art in Unreal, which is meant to invite environment artists to step up their game uh, to grow into their next level of becoming the environment artist that they want to be to be competitive in this amazing field. So what specifically do you want to share with our audience today? I understand you might even be showing off some of your students work from prior classes. And dude, the reins are yours, man. Yeah, that yeah, sounds good. So yeah, I have a, a screen to share. If, uh, is that is that already set up? Yeah, it's there? already up, man. Good, good to go. go. All right. So yeah, so uh, yeah, we're just gonna be talking about uh, a little bit about different things. We're gonna go over some student work. We're gonna talk about a little bit about a uh, presentation about uh, visual storytelling. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. 
So he's already kind of given an introduction about me. So yeah, just a little bit about me. I'm studio owner and creative director at Daggercon Studios and a principal artist at Midwinter Entertainment. Um, then we've kind of gone over <laughs> the kind of introduction so far. But yeah, so the, the class that they talked about, um, it's, it's UE4 modular environments. Um, this class is a uh, pretty inclusive. It goes over all sorts of stuff. So uh, some of the stuff that we'll be talking about, like is uh, an overview is like, we talk about uh, Unreal workflow process. We talk about creating a block out. We talk about modular construction and application. Uh, understanding texture, size, and density, um, in-depth shader development and creation. We talk about uh, visual storytelling, uh, baking and marmoset, uh, making and using trim sheets and tileables, texturing using Substance Painter, uh, lighting and post-process in Unreal, and uh, setup and usage of cinematic cameras. Um, and the class also includes a, a live hour-long Q&A session each week for 10 weeks, and it's also got a, um, a weekly assignment, and I give feedback uh, every week uh, pre-recorded for you so that you know it's like directly relative to what we'll be discussing in class. Um, and in general, while it's called uh, modular environments, uh, the class, it's pretty much just for anybody that's like really interested in like knowing the uh, environment art production workflow um, from start to finish. So like from starting from a block out process to finishing up with a fully created environment. And uh, one of my favorite things about just the amount of students that have come to my class, this is the fourth year I've been teaching this. Uh, is it just the amount of tremendous growth that the students that come into the class have and just like the, the heights that they achieve after they've taken the class. So uh, these are just some of the places that students that have taken my class uh, literally short after, shortly after taking my class uh, got jobs at these locations. And so it's great to see their success. And it was really encouraging for me to know that like what they learned from the class, they carried on to their, uh, their, their full time jobs. OK, cool. So let's see some cool art. So uh, here's some past, some past examples of some people that were in my class. Um, so Sergey, this is one of the assignments that he did for the class. I uh, wanted to create something that was very kind of similar to the Wolfenstein feel. So we'll just go through some of these shots. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the, uh, oh, there you go. There you go. I was like, what yeah. is, oh, it's coming up. <laughs> yeah, so here's some shots from Sergey's work. I'll just kind of scrub through some of these. So you guys can send and see some of the past student works here. Um, and I'll have a, a student list at the very end of the presentation as well, too, if you ever, if you want to go check out some of their art stations and see what they're doing now. But, like, all these guys are now in a professional setting. So some really cool stuff here. He's even got a little bit of fly through here of some of his stuff. And then Quentin, here's an awesome scene from him. He really, it was a really cool scene of the a hospital here. And all these were the scenes that they actually worked on and created during the class. So in the class, there's no like restrictions as to what you can make. Um, it's typically just the workflow that we go over. So we'll be going over like basically like all those modular pipelines is to create these larger scale environments um, and how to do them effectively. There was a question about what the level of students um, uh, for the what you're uh, showing and stuff in terms of sure yeah so so a lot of these students that came in uh, it really just depends on uh, I guess your background but for the most part I would say you're just above like just kind of getting breaking into the industry of understanding the process so if you know how to make a neural map you know how to model in Maya and you've even just remotely opened UE4 this class is pretty much for you so we pretty much go over everything else you would need to know uh, relative to that which is pretty good so like. Uh, even if you have never experienced UE4 before, we have tons of people that are coming from film, that are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds that take this class, and by the end of the class, they fully understand how to do like a, a UE4 uh, full environment. That's cool. Excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, so some really cool stuff. I love the kind of cinematic feel that Gregory got in the scene. Really cool. Yeah, I love the depth of feel he's getting, too, with uh, some of that with the, the lens stuff. That's really For cool. sure, yeah. It's yeah, terrific work. Excellent. Yeah. Oh my God. Here. Awesome. Some sci-fi stuff. I love the sci-fi stuff. It's very cool. They definitely had a really good use of bloom and the color lighting and the color palette in general. Awesome, awesome use. Yep. I mean, the, the richness of the, the, the uh, some of these projects are really amazing. Um, you know, I know you mentioned it, but like, I mean, I guess it's a big part of the class. So, you know, um, I know there was a question uh, that we got is like, how do you build a storyline for the theme of the environment? And it seems like each of these presentations are doing a really good job of making you feel like whatever we, whatever happened before we arrived was pretty compelling, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's something actually we're going to be focusing on the presentation is that, that visual storytelling. That's actually one of my favorite parts about these, this class and the environment storytelling is like, how you're able to convey a story without even saying a word. It's just like all of these have like a specific message you're trying to convey or like some kind of background story as to what happened in this space. Jason's was really cool as well, for sure. 
And they're building these within the course of um, a given semester, uh, or do they kind of extend out? Um, are some of these like uh, they started yeah, in so, class? And so I would say within the ten weeks, they're able to, to uh, complete a lot of the assignment. Uh, generally, each each week is kind of set up so that you accomplish a different type of uh, task or goal for the class. So, say for instance, uh, the first week might be like. Uh, just getting an idea of how the editor works, like how to make a blockout shape, just getting your general idea together. The next week is like kind of like putting that idea in the engine and starting to kind of test the, the build, see what works for you. And each week you'll accomplish something different that kind of leads you to the end. And so by the end of the class, I would say not everyone completes like their full environment. But by the end of the class, I've never had a student say to me, like, I'm, I'm not I'm not quite sure how to finish my 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 environment. They'll always say, oh, even though I didn't finish every single thing for the environment that I'm working on, I might take another five to ten weeks to finish everything out. But I've achieved basically all the tools I need to kind of complete that and kind of push it to that final delivery quality. That's great. It's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a here's an example of like kind of the some of the sets that they'll you'll be building in the classes. So it's kind of like we try to make it so that it's by the end of the class you have like a, a full environment that only needs a small limited amount of props. So you're able to create something that's much more grandiose with a limited uh, pipeline scope. Got it. Cool. Terrific. So yeah, so that brings us to our presentation here. Um, so we'll be going Jorge Munez was asking, what level of Unreal experience do you need to take full advantage of the class? I, um, I would mention that earlier. Yeah, I would say just even just generally opening it and taking a look before the class. We've had a lot of students that come into the class that maybe have uh, only looked at, maybe I'd say only spent like an hour in the engine, just kind of getting like an idea of like how the controls work and they have no issue. Yeah, okay. Go for it, man. Right, We're ready cool. for it. All right. So yeah, so back on track. So what we'll just be talking about today is we're going to talk about uh, overview of uh, just general uh, visual and uh, like storytelling. We're going to talk about tone and mood and response. We're going to talk about establishing identity, uh, time, history and passage of time, place, cause and effect, and focus and direction. Hmm. So why should I care about visual storytelling? That's the thing that a lot of people ask is a lot of times people in general, when you're, when you're looking at any kind of environment or you're, you're playing any kind of game, typically you need to some kind of immersion. There's needs to be some kind of immersion, some kind of attachment to you, the player and you, the person viewing the scene and also the environment that you're showing. So you want to think of the scene as not only uh, as essentially an environment that you're creating, but you want to actually captivate the player in some way by giving them some context clues as to what's going on in the scene or how do they should be interpreting the scene visually. So the first thing we're going to talk about is tone and mood and response. So tone, mood, and response are probably one of the, the biggest things. So that's probably one of the most visual things you'll see right away when you're, when you're, you're playing any game is the tone, mood, and response. So we can see here in something like a game like Fallout 76, we have like this like really heavy yellow color cast going on in the scene with like this kind of like foreboding figures with a lot of silhouette shapes and shadows. And this is kind of meant to provide mood. So the game's not like this for the entire time, but during parts of the game when it is like this, this kind of gives you the context of like the sudden danger this kind of sense of eerie kind of uh, you know murkiness that of being unsure of what's out there kind of in the space between you and the fog and the kind of background area and again 76 a completely different scene but from the same game so we can see here we have these like bright colored trees very open road it kind of is alluring to kind of open you making you want to open and explore the space and these are two different things from the same game so in the other in the other scenario it's an area where you'd be fighting a boss or you'd be doing something that would kind of be telling a story of like staying more closer to the area that you're 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 in at the moment whereas this is kind of a, a, a alluring you to try to more travel, explore the space, to explore your surroundings, to look around you and to really be comfortable because the more comfortable you are as a player and when you're immersed in that space, the more you're gonna be open to like check things out and like look through these different areas that you might not have necessarily explored otherwise, um, especially in a game where it's like kind of scary, you know, like a lot of games that you'll play that are kind of like more ominous and foreboding, you kind of have the sense of like, oh, I'll just kind of keep a tight look around me and you don't wanna be too, too you wanna be pretty cautious about exploring. But when you have games that are much more open and much more visually uh, pleasing and much more, uh, I guess, like has a sense of like uh, calmness, you feel much more open to want to explore that space. And here we have a shot from Gears 5. So this is a kind of a different mood where you have this like really blue color cast going on. We have these kind of like scary, like, uh, you know, icicles across the trees. And this is just kind of giving you that sense of danger, that kind of sense of like, you know, your life's in jeopardy kind of thing. And then all those kind of things build a tone, sense, or mood while you're playing the game as to like how you should be feeling to those, through those particular moments of the gameplay. 
here's a shot from uh, Resident Evil. Um, and so this is like one of those things too. Color can play an important composition uh, note to your scenes as well. This is almost completely sepia tone. Um, and that can play an important idea as to like, you know, like time period and understanding like the context of the room and understanding, even though it just might be simple, some simple props in the space, just the idea of the color cast alone can give the idea of kind of a foreboding temp temperature or mood. I really love that piece, by the way, dude. That's like it's just totally starting to push my, you know, 1920s, 30s, like, film. Definitely. But, yeah, this is really great. And then the other thing is, too, we can do uh, counter. So essentially, like, if you have a game, like, say, for instance, Last of Us, or a game where, like, the tone typically throughout the entire game is very dark or moody, what we can do is at times we can give the players a kind of a, a, a chance to relax their eyes and to kind of relax their mood. If you keep people on high end the entire game, games don't have really a lot of, like, ebb and flow. And so you get kind of this point where you're just, like, you're constantly on high end and you're constantly alert all the time. You're constantly scared. It's just It doesn't allow the player to have relaxation. And also, so you have, like, more, like, exciting moments in the game so you have ups and downs and so sometimes when you break that you go the opposite way of what the rest of the game entails visually it allows the player to kind of give a, a bit of relaxation and then here's a scene i created so uh generally for my, art, my own artwork I, I really enjoy like the idea of like taking a mundane space and kind of selling a story or mood or tone um, as a whole so with this space it's just a simple laundromat but with the color co the color palette and how the, the composition's framed and generally like the fov and a, a bunch of other things we're able to kind of convey the sense of like kind of the eerie uh you know sudden suspense that it's like i'm not quite sure if anything could happen even though it's in a, a normally safe place just the just the color tone and mood itself provides me that that something kind of is eerie a bit here and here's another shot of that same scene Wow, look at the mood. That's a, just unbelievable, like, mood that's being created in that. Wow, it's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the next thing we're going to talk about is establishing identity. And this is another favorite of mine as, as well, too. So establishing identity is really important. I feel like a lot of times uh, environment artists, when they first start out, they have this idea of like, oh, if it's a supermarket, I'll name it supermarket. And it's like, that's not always the best thing to do because then you're not able to establish a real identity or location to the places that you're making. And so by actually giving false names or ideas to the places that you're establishing, that gives more immersion to those, those the viewer and the player and whoever else sees your scene as to like understanding it at this is a universe that they're now viewing they're now in they've now entered and it actually has its own places like states names locations countries all those things regardless if they're real or not so here's a scene uh from gears of war 4 uh, i got to work on a lot of the assets for this scene as well um uh, mostly for like the the iconography and like labeling of the scene and so uh with this guy essentially we're just trying to create this space where um it had this idea of like this once like powerful conglomerate of burger like companies you know after this post-apocalyptic world and so by doing this we're establishing that there there was a universe and there was a place before we existed in this in this world like before we our our own eyes saw this location this was something way beyond us so that it kind of gives it more of a feeling of like the universe is bigger than the player themselves And here's the one of the assets I made for that as well for this, the the major burger mascot here, and one of the signs I also created for that. It's so awesome, man! It's pushing my to uh, my, my Toy Story, but or actually uh, Cars button. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I go to the uh, the round the rust, sixty-six, the yeah. rusties, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is really cool, man. And this is a, another shot from that same scene. Another artist worked on this particular location in the level. But you can see here, we're still establishing that story. We're giving an idea to a basis of location. Even the background, we can see like the plateaus within the background that give an idea of like, oh, this must be some kind of desert area. And this must be some, you know, where, you know, RVs used to stay. And it had all these like, you know, nice amenities and things of that nature. But we're all just seeing this secondhand as to like, we're, we're now entering this space as a viewer. And we're understanding that this space existed way before we were there. And the other thing is too, with iconography, it really it really can be simple or complex. So for the instance, for instance, in Gears, one of my favorite things was that it could be really simple as like establishing who owned something or who controlled something by the iconography on it. So like during Gears, anytime you had that cog symbol, symbol you knew that you know that the coalition owned this this property. This was once a, a coalition funded asset. You know. However, this was established and made, it was made by the coalition. And so having all these branding and these, these terms of like uh, iconography on those, those assets within the scene, it gives you that idea without even having to be told that. 
So even without all the words on it, you could remove all that and you could still see by the cog symbol that this was owned by the, the coalition. This is another scene that I worked on. Uh, this one's a bit older, um, but this one you can see like a lot of the, the iconography in the background and labeling is uh, Russian. So we get an idea of, of context, of sense of time, sense of place, and then where we're at in the world. So without even having to do much or say much, we already kind of have an idea of, of where we're grounded as a player. So if we were to immediately jump into a game that looked just like this, we would immediately have a general idea or context as to where we are located. Hmm. That's another shot from that same scene. Um, and here's, another, here's the outside of that laundromat that we were talking about earlier. So we can see here with the labeling of the King Wash, we know that this is like a branded location. So we can assume that either this is a franchise or something that exists in this, this imaginary world that we're creating. The same, same thing goes to this Fizz machine that's in there. It's just another layer of branding. So even like, it, it, it really de depends. It's like, as you're creating these assets and as you're creating these stories, it's really important to even think about the little nuances. So something like soda, instead of naming the soda machine soda, it makes it so much more fulfilling to the player and the viewer if they see a soda machine that actually represents something that they could imagine being a real life soda company. So Fizz is the company that we've made up here. Here's a shot from The Division. And you can see here they're, they're labeling a lot of things in the background as well with a, a lot of the, the, the market supermarket. And they have a lot of advertisement signs and advertisements on the walls here. And you can see here, again, from The Division, we have some advertisements for the buildings here on the left. And that just all gives context to where you are. Here's another shot from Fallout 76. Um, so this is really cool because they've established this branding of this uh, uh, gas station that's essentially throughout the entire world in multiple locations. But every time you see one of these, you, you kind of have an idea of once you've seen it once, you have an idea of like, oh, next time I see that, I kind of know what this is. I kind of know what's to be expected in there. And I kind of know what my interaction with the space will be because I've already explored one before. So they've actually promoted a franchise in a fake world that you already understand and anticipate based on your first experience. I love the, the fact that uh, so many of these images have really stunning um, design points of view in terms of uh, the shapes uh, that you're kind of putting up there. You know, I mean, obviously it's th a 3D space, but there's a, a real sense of uh, really thinking about, you know, the interrelationships of the big, medium and small uh, forms. And um, just, um, I, I'm, you know, it's just great to see that kind of thinking blend and, you know, awesome. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important that, and this, this kind of goes back to what you were talking about. It's like scale, understanding like like landmarks, like understanding like a large landmark in a space can tell so much about the story, the history of the space, and just like so much about what you're trying to say. So we can see from this, uh, this shot from Days Gone, but we can see this giant lumberjack standing on the stack of pancakes. And it's like, without saying a word, without having a sign, without having anything that gives us context or clues, we immediately kind of get an idea of what kind of location we are. We're probably in the Pacific Northwest because of the lumberjack. And we also have this like giant stack of pancakes so we know that we're at a, a restaurant and then from the context clues around us we can tell that it's been abandoned here's a shot from red dead uh similar story we have the trackers hotel so they're really branded their, their location so that you remember oh i'm going to go back to that location i once saw the trackers hotel and i remember that as a space or landmark within that space it gives it a sense of uh real world realism even if it's no it's, that's not a real world and then another thing too is like, we don't always have to say things. We don't have to like have signs that promote that information. We don't always have to like have like actual words that spell things out. Just having little context clues, little props, little assets that really tell a story. We can establish who exactly the person that lives in this room is, what kind of life they're living, what their hobbies are, what they enjoy, what kind of things they just like in general. Lighting is beautiful. Uh, there's a question by a student just uh, asking sure. how much... Uh, in the class, you go into uh, light map baking. Um, they, you know, they just said student renders look great. I was like, I agree. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah. So yeah, we talk we talk a whole uh, uh, week about lighting. So like, it, there's there's one course that comes up in week nine that we essentially go through all the types of lighting. We talk about how to go about light baking. We talk about what process works best. Uh, for your scenario, we talk about uh, relative to each uh, student's assignment as to what they're working on, what lighting I would suggest. We also talk about like, you know, light baking. We talked about the quality of that and how to set that up properly per asset. And we definitely go into pretty in-depth detail for lighting overall. Cool. So, yes. Good to know. 
So this one, next one is going to be talking about time. So time is really important because establishing that time can really give a sense of player uh, or a viewer an idea of uh, what what year they're in or what kind of range of years they're in. So even just sometimes the spelling it out is, is really simple, but it doesn't always have to be spelled out. Sometimes we can take context clues from, from how people are dressed, you know, the, the kind of props and things we see around the scene as to what time period it is, you know, the quality of those assets and things of that nature. So you can see here we have this, uh, like a lot of like, Kind of retro vibe to all this stuff. We get an idea from the typography. You get an idea from the color grading. We also get an idea from the, the, the clothes that the characters are wearing and all the props in the scene. And the same goes here. You can see the sign in the back here giving this idea of that time period as well. And then I, I sometimes really like the kind of subtle clues as to spelling instead of spelling out things. So we can actually establish time on this scene based on one thing, and that's the price of the gas. So by saying the price of the gas and knowing your, what context, how much gas costs per every given year that you know you're you fueling your car, you can kind of get an estimate as to what year range we're in. So if you know that the you know gas was like five years ago a certain price, and that's the kind of price that that sign is showing, you can get an idea that this has probably been an abandoned space for some time. <laughs> Definitely looks like California prices. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> And the same goes for this, like even though uh, this space could technically be, you know, downtown Tokyo or something, somewhere where the, the, there's a lot of neon and stuff like that. Just from our context of understanding what game spaces generally try to tell us, we can see from a lot of the little like nuances in the scene, like the light up sidewalk and all that kind of stuff. That this is definitely farther in the future than just somewhere that's in present day. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hey, we had a question from one of the guys just, um, he was asking because the, the class has been running for a few years now and he mm -hmm. says, uh, were there any modules or weeks that have recently updated to uh, keep current with industry standards? I'm like, you know, I got to believe. Yeah, but I'm not going to speak for you. Yeah, perfect uh, question. So, yeah, that's actually happening right now. So this next this next quarter that's coming up uh, in, a, in about a month is actually going to be the fully new updated course. So we're going to be going over Unreal 4.25. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of new concepts in there. We're going to talk about the new uh, cameras that they have in there. And a lot of the concepts have been updated as well, too. So but wait, I think when I originally started the class and created the class, um, it was using Quixel. And now it's using uh, Substance Painter um, to talk about texturing process. We talk a little bit about uh, Quixel Mixer as well, too. Um, and then we're also going to be talking about uh, Marmoset for baking. So we go through that entire process as well, too. So everything's updated to what I would suggest currently as to my workflow that I use day to day for my professional workflow. Yeah, I love Marmoset for baking. Uh, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this scene is a, a scene from God of War. So, again, it doesn't have to be based in real, real world for you to understand what kind of time period it is. So we can establish from just seeing the props and the assets in the scene that it's an ancient period. It doesn't have to be a realistic period. It doesn't have to be one based in our reality. It can be something that is just based on the context of understanding the props and how things are made themselves. And here's a scene that I had created uh, a while back, which is uh, essentially established in the 1970s. So not only does the, the actual assets in the scene that are all built within that time period, but also the color grading kind of leans into that uh, kind of time period of the 1970s. Hmm. Yep. Another shot from that scene as well. Man, that rotary phone. I actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, old, I'm probably a little bit older than you, Clinton, on this front. But uh, yeah, I've used those rotary phones for oh, sure. Oh, I, I definitely remember those. Yeah, my, I, my, my mom <laughs> and grandmother both had one for a long time. <laughs> wow. Uh, the fan, too, is really uh, prototypical. So. So yeah, so the next thing in, in general context of this is also making models. So like just like you were talking about, the rotary phone, those fans, all thinking about how that kind of plays context into what year you're trying to sell as to what time period it is, because that can play a big part. A lot of times, uh, environment artists, when they're first starting out and they don't really, they're not really quite thinking about all those, those parts of the process, they'll think, oh, I'll make this thing that's made out of metal and it does this. And it's like, oh, that metal wasn't even around at that point, or they weren't even using that type of thing to make that kind of asset at that time. So you always have to be aware of the context of the, of the asset. And actually, a lot of times you'll find that you're learning way more about how things were constructed during like time, different time periods. Uh, and that's just part of the research of being in a good environment artist and telling a compelling story. Mm -hmm. And here's a set uh, from Decagon that we uh, released, and it's essentially just all assets from the kind of our art, uh, art deco period. And you can see they all have a or they all have a consistent look. They all have a feeling of that that art deco time. The same here as well. Yeah, that's why I'm a big fan of uh, art history for um, artists in general. I mean, I never used to understand when I was in school the purpose of art history, but the purpose of art history is so that you can 
be a multilingual artist. And if you don't know what Art Deco looks like, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to research it and um, be acquainted with some of that. So I think it's great to see that. Definitely. I, I totally agree. I think a lot of times when you, when you at first are kind of examining those things, you kind of take it for granted. And then years later, you realize how much more collective knowledge and understanding you have of those different time periods and how to convey those, those messages visually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. It's a whole vocabulary. So yeah, next is a uh, history and passage of time. So this is just basically talking about like what's happened here over the course of its years. Like how old is it? Like those kind of things. So you can really tell a story with just even one asset. So this is one of my favorite assets from uh, Decagon that is just really telling a really compelling story in that you can see the wear, you can see the damage, you can see the years of use this thing has had. And I think those kind of things really tell a story where you have like, if you had a scene that was completely clean, was never been touched, it wouldn't be very realistic because like generally everything at some point has had some kind of wear or tear or usage. And so showing that through your actual assets and through your environment can really tell a great story. The same goes for this asset as well. You can just see here the wear and tear on this this device. You know, it, I just uh, there was a question here um, that uh, somebody had about, um, you know, with so many developments. I know when I was learning, uh, ZBrush was the initial kind of like if you want to add little bits of high frequency detail to models, you would do that. But it just seems like how little of ZBrush do you need to know now in the current climate in the presence of like programs like painter, mm -hmm. uh, designer, and Quixel. Um, you know, is, is ZBrush for an art, environment artist a still a must have, or is that changed now for you? Um, I would say I still use it pretty regularly, but I, I would say I work with a lot of people that, that essentially don't use it at all. Like I, I, my art director, Taylor Brandenberger, he, he has done a similar process with like, say for instance, if I were to have a staircase and I wanted to add chipping to the edge, I could do it through ZBrush, but he's also promoted a simple way of doing the exact same process through Painter. And so there's always multiple ways. That's the greatest part about environment art is there's always multiple ways to tackle how you create any one asset. And so, uh, for instance, somebody was asking me today, like, oh, how I created a certain pouch that I was making that was like a, uh, like a post-apocalyptic looking like bag. And it's like, well, I created the simple uh, mesh in Maya, and then I basically took it into ZBrush, did a few bigger folds, and then I took it into Painter at the very end, and then I added all the micro folds. And so, like, there's just layers that you can add on, and it doesn't always have to be in one certain program that you're doing that. So, knowing multiple does help, but I wouldn't say it's always a necessity. There's always multiple ways around any kind of kind of solution that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, it's a, it, I just figured I'd ask because I'm kind of similar, old school like that with you, and I can't believe I'm saying old school. <laughs> uh, but to say reference ZBrush is sort of, it's still present, it's still around, it's still kicking butt, you know, on the sculpting side, but there are a lot new, a lot of new players now, and it's great to see. Definitely, it's the yeah. best time to be an artist. It's yes. totally the best time to be an artist. For sure. Man, I, I do not miss the days of hand doing everything in Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Oh, uh, each layer. Uh, I know. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, this is another thing I, I created a while back for Decagon, and it's essentially like just telling that story again with like time and, and passage of time. It's essentially you can see the, the underlayer of the initial acts of it used to be in its former life, now, you know, repurposed for this post apocalyptic world that it's, it's kind of coming to. Yeah, and again, just telling tell, more telling the layers of story on all these assets. Some of my some of my favorite kind of assets that we can that we make for sure. Same goes with this. Yeah, and this is a shot from Days Gone. Again, just that uh, storytelling. You can see here that we have this garage with space that was once used by you know the storage and whatnot, and now you can see it's been abandoned for some time. You can just tell through all the environmental storytelling throughout the scene. We kind of get an idea of how long and how long it's been abandoned and not used. And the same goes with this shot from Metro. And another shot from the game I'm working on, Scavengers, you can see here just like the, the sense of passage of time. We know what the original use of this house might have been, you know, someone lived here, and now it's been abandoned and used as like a war ground. The next one we have is a place, and this is probably one of the easiest ones to establish, but also really important. So establishing place is really important. So say, for instance, you know, 42 million people a year, 40, 40, yeah, 42 million people a year visit Las Vegas, Nevada. So that means 42 people, uh, you know, a year have some kind of context of what that location looks like. If you were to show that in a game immediately, be like, oh, that's Las Vegas. I get it. Like, oh, that's cool. I like how they did that. This looks like that area. This looks like that area. While we have on the other hand, another place that's considered still a tourist location, but we only have two, 2 million people a year that visit a place called Leavenworth, Washington. So 
what this means is that we can kind of have more room to play with those spaces when we have an area like Leavenworth, Washington, because it can be a tourist location. It can be someone that's fun to explain, someone that's fun to visually, uh, you know, to illustrate in your scene, but we can kind of be a little bit more playful with that scene because people might have an idea of what it might look like, but you, they don't have direct context typically. So we can, we have a little more flexibility in there. So again, we know everyone, most people know what the White House looks like. We have an idea of what it looks like. So as soon as you put that White House in the scene, you're like, oh, I'm in Washington, DC. I know exactly where I'm at. I don't need, I don't need all the other clues to tell me because the White House tells me right away. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Fallout 76, it's in West Virginia. Not a lot of people have been to West Virginia. So you could immediately say, oh, uh, I think this is somewhere like, you know, uh, in the country, kind of like in the hills, it looks like. So you got to have a little bit more room to play as to get an idea as to what kind of story you want to tell visually with the space. Here's a sh uh, shot from the order. So 1886. And so same thing, London, different time, different timeline, but same kind of universe as us. So we have that space to kind of ground us in a reality that doesn't exist, but is a place that is a real place. So that's kind of cool that we have these kind of like pseudo kind of ideas coming together as one. And here's a shot from Red Dead as to, uh, you know, we don't really quite know exactly the location, but we know it's somewhere in the, in the, you know, the West that, that is kind of being explored as like frontier land. Now, one of the last ones is cause and effect. So cause and effect is just basically thinking about uh, showing visual cues as to like, oh, what's happened or what will happen and how will that uh, in fact in impact the area? How will that change the location that you're looking at? And how does that kind of tell a story, you know, from start to finish to the player without having to be told anything directly? So say, for instance, you go into a space and you see like a zombie on the floor, or, like a dead body, you immediately know, kind of have an idea of like, oh, there's some kind of something that's happened here. Like this person, this zombie's dead. So like, you know, immediately you have context of like, oh, there's, you know, obviously something's happened here. And the same goes for any kind of environmental storytelling. It doesn't have to be a zombie. It could be literally be anything. Like all those kind of things give context clues as to what happened here previously. So we have like the plume of smoke in the background. We have like the blood scattered on the floor. We have these cars and stuff that have been abandoned their spires we know this space has been abandoned but we also have an idea of like oh it was being used for something and now it's not so like we have an idea that that time has passed through here and there's been a bit of big occurrence that have happened here it's like a dangerous occurrence Here's a shot from Metro, same kind of thing. We can see the tank, we can see like this like, you know, frozen world. So we know that something, at, at one point this place was like a healthy, you know, functioning city. Uh, and then something, you know, happened with war, something happened with an ice age, all these kind of things collectively added on to the original series of what once existed. Here's a shot from Last of Us. We can see here like the dead moose. We know that something caused that. So we have an idea to be aware. We have a more uh, like kind of alertness to our surroundings and that kind of carries more immersion with that space. And sometimes games will even let you revisit the same location twice to give you context as to actually what happened. So we can see here on the left, we have the original area from Fallout that you start at the beginning of the game and then the later part of Fallout after the post-apocalyptic kind of war happens. So it gives you context as to like cause and event. And the last one is going to talk about is focus and direction. So focus and direction is a fun one because you get to kind of be a little more playful with this, with kind of like establishing your own kind of story. So you can see here in Days Gone, they frame the space to give an idea of exactly where the player should be heading, but also they kind of give this in impending sense of danger so that you know you're walking into something kind of more ominous and kind of unsecure. And here they're using bright, you know, bright red colors. They're using lighting. So they're using all their kind of uh, available storytelling elements to really push you here. This is a little bit more over the head, but there's there's more, you know, kind of like lighthearted ways to do this. But this just kind of showed like you can really push like the the direction of the player's view, the viewer in, in general to understand what's the what things should I be gathering here as, as the story is unfolding. And shot, another shot here for from uh, God of War, same kind of thing. You're really just selling the direction of which the player should be moving and which is, what's the more safer location, being here in this cave with all this lava or being out there in this little bit more of an open space. And the last off is the shot from Bioshock, same kind of thing. You're just kind of selling that with the lighting. You're saying like, hey, look here. This is really important for you for the story events. This is kind of like one of the story beats. And so you don't want the, the, the player to miss this kind of space while ex exploring your kind of environment. Hey, we, we have a question, couple of questions that have been kind of popping up. Sure, yeah, let's hear them. And um, uh, Shad, uh, Shadi Hamza just mentioned, it's like, do environment artists have to model every component in the environment and how often do you use 3D assets from Quixel or any other 3D asset sites? 
Sure. Yeah. So the, at some point, some environment artists will typically, like, well, there has to be an environment artist that models something, whether it be you or through an outsource partner or through, you know, resources like you have like mega scans. And I think this is a pretty common question. I actually get in my class a lot is like, oh, is it okay to use mega scans in your environments or use like resources like that? And I would say, absolutely. Like, it, it would be like me saying, if I was using Photoshop, I don't want to use Painter because that's cheating. You know, like it, there's always going to be advances in the industry. And with tech, it always comes really quick advances. And so sometimes people get a little, a little uncomfortable with how quickly that comes. But if you were to work in a studio scenario, you have to think about it. What are they going to do if you started a studio and you're working as an environment artist? They're not going to say, yeah, let's just make everything from scratch and blow the entire budget in like two weeks. They're going to be like, let's just be as, as smart as we can. Let's use resources that we can. Let's make the assets that we want to be unique. And it's going to be like kind of a lot of flexibility with understanding that process as to like every studio is going to be different, but most studios want to like exercise and use as many resources as they can. But they also want you to build the really important aspects of the scene that really kind of sell the character of the game. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Now we got an, another question from um, Femke Mays, mm -hmm. um, asking about the workload for the course. And it's a good question, I guess, because they're trying to decide they have uh, a day job. And um, you know, if you had a day job, what would be advice for someone who's going to be looking at taking your course? What is, sure. what, is what is the anticipated workload? So I know it's going to change. Yeah, of course. So it all it all depends on you. So in the class, I've structured it so it's basically like each assignment per week is kind of the bare minimum to understand the fundamentals of that that week. So it's say for instance, if it was lighting, I'd give you an assignment as to be like, here's what you need to do to understand these fundamentals. Beyond that, it's up to you and how far you want to push your scene, you want to push yourself to get more achieved. So if you're like we've had over the course of the last four years since I've run this class, we've had stay at home parents, we've had people that have working day jobs, we have people that are working night jobs, we have people that are caring for their family. We have people, all sorts of people that have their own day-to-day -day lives. And so I, I wouldn't say that I've ever seen anyone come in and be like, oh, this is completely impossible to achieve this class. It's just a matter of, of, of you know, really just seeing how much you want to push yourself. But I would say the core fundamentals of the class are, are very achievable each week, even if it's just a nighttime thing that you're doing. Yeah, I think, uh, they, I think uh, there were some people like, um, wondering if you were going to touch a little bit on the pipelines as well. That's probably what the class is going to be about. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, so the class, is, yeah, the class is, is tons and tons of pipeline. So it, it's, it really goes from like literally beginning with the block out, understanding how you transition that block out into final modular pieces, then taking those modular pieces and texturing them using those trim workflows and pipelines and tileables, understanding draw calls and how that affects your, your performance and then establishing that scene. And then really creating that, that, that telling that story. And it's like, I think it's all those things are important, but it really is, it's really important to start understanding what kind of story you're trying to tell. So I think this is one of the, that, that's why I really like visual storytelling because it's like, it's really the core fundamental of, of what you're trying to do. I've had many students that have rushed into, a, into my class and they said at the beginning, they're like, ah, I'm not quite sure what story I'm trying to tell. I'm not going to think about that for now. I'm just going to make all these assets. And then without fail, week five comes and they're like, oh man, I should have thought about what story I'm trying to tell, like what I'm trying to even convey. Like what's, what is I'm trying to do in the scene? Because you'll really find yourself lost without this kind of core fundamental of establishing what the scene is going to be. It's a good, that's a good um, point to make. And I think it definitely, uh, you know, managing scope is probably the single biggest challenge most artists have, uh, including myself. <laughs> so definitely. I totally get it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's one thing that a lot of students will say about uh, how I kind of run the course is that I'm, I'm, I'm extremely almost overly honest about what I suggest to you as to get the best out of your scene. So sometimes if you say, oh, I want to make a castle with a dragon and like this battle going on in the background and mountains and fire and lava and all this stuff. And I'll be like, no, no, no. Let's talk about this space. This is, this is a space we should focus on. And then what we could do is we can work out from there. So really concentrating on establishing those core fundamentals, understanding first, building a solid scene that if you had to put that in your portfolio by itself, it would still stand without all these additional elements. And then at that point, if you feel like the need to continue to push out further into adding those extra elements you talked about at the beginning, that's the time you would take those core fundamentals and make that something much more grandiose. Cool. Hey, there, there was a, a couple of other questions that we got ahead of this. Um, and I just want to, because I thought it was interesting. It's like, it's a simple question. It's like, how much do you worry about poly counts these days? Um, you know, you got Unreal 5 that's talking about changing the game on that front. But un, until that's like widely used and spread, I guess, what can you tell us a little bit about where the trends are going for, I guess, things that were, you know, still real concerns when it comes to, you know, managing poly count, frame rate, and you know, draw calls and, you know, texture sizes, you know, 
what are the trends that you seeing being in the in the in the, the industry as long as you've been? For sure, yeah. I, I think poly count is still always going to be something you're concerned about. Any kind of thing, any kind of resource that you're bringing to the engine to display visually to have rendered, it's always going to be something that you're basically pulling resources away from the computer to be able to render for you. And as computers get faster, as our software gets faster, and all those things you know advance, we're always going to be you know have less and less restrictions. But I would say, like, I think the day that the Unreal Five demo came out, it was really cool, and I loved it. But I'm pretty sure every tech artist weeped by all the all the kind of like kind of like insecurities of like infinite poly count because like I would say like take that with a grain of salt because I remember back when Unreal Four came out they said oh we're not gonna have to bake light maps ever again here we are still baking light maps so I always take everything that comes out as like a like a tech demo with a grain of salt because they're showing you the best and at, at, at the best quality they could possibly get. And that's not always the case with every scenario you have. Every stu every studio is going to do something differently and everyone's going to be creating something differently. You personally, on a personal project, most likely you're still going to be very concerned about poly counts. You're going to be very concerned about draw calls. All those things are going to matter because that's going to really what makes your scene perform it. Now, a smaller scene is always going to have less of a, of a chug, you know, on the engine or have like less resources that it's using. But those are all things you still really want to be, you know, well, well concerned about because those are going to be things that you're carrying into that job when you first get that first job. If you come into the studio the first day and you're, they're like, oh, we loved your scene. And you're like, oh, I love that chair in your scene. Like how many polys is that? And you're like, oh, that was like 200,000 polys. They're going to be like, whoa, what? <laughs> so like you really want to still be aware of those things and those restrictions and kind of enforce them on yourself early so that you understand, oh, when we do have those limitations lifted at later times and we're using technology that allows for more, that you're able to then go up, not not come back down from where you were already at a high point. Okay. Um, that's awesome. That's great. I, I'm, the, the questions are coming in now. Um, sure. I just wanted to kind of, uh, pull them out. It's like, um, so, uh, this is from Sam Del Fonte. Uh, and he says, obviously this, uh, this is focused on your current class, but do you have class more advanced artists, uh, like people already in the industry looking to move up a level. I'm like thinking your class is pretty, um, pretty damn advanced already. So I guess my question on that point is, is, Who's, you know, where do you need to be to really kind of like, you know, because I'm like thinking, man, this class would probably be awesome way to level up if you already got something and then you're going deeper into your skill sets. I'm, you know, what's your point of view on this? Definitely. So I think that's one of the biggest reasons why when I initially created the class, I wasn't like, oh, everyone's going to be creating this scene because that kind of restricts the kind of creativity and, and uh, technical aspirations as to what you want to explore. And so what I have a lot of times is students will come into my class with pretty ranged uh, abilities. So we have students that come in that basically have never touched on real before. They're just getting to learn it and they're, they're building their first scene and they're trying to understand the pipeline. And then we'll have students that have basically been in the industry for three or four years. They're just, they've either been in mobile or they're doing something that they're not quite wanting to do. They're maybe they're a lighter, maybe they're in film, but they know the basics. They know the general ideas as to, as to, as to what was required to make a scene. And they maybe even made a scene or two, but this is kind of like the next step as to make sure their pipeline and their flow is correct with kind of industry standards. So I find that we do get a lot of people that have actually like are currently in the industry that just want to kind of like either they want to learn on real tech. They want to just know how to better, you know, more effectively use the pipeline, or they just kind of want feedback as to like how, how they kind of progress themselves. And a lot of times students will even use the class as like a way to be like, I want to get something done in 10 weeks. I know I'm a procrastinator. I know I'm not a person that can easily just like go on and do their own thing. And so taking this class kind of gives them a, a strict kind of like more of a, a dedicated timeline as to complete things. Yeah, I, I, I definitely relate to that, you know, having been a working parent and the like. And I knew that uh, when it was easier to tell the kids, um, daddy's got homework. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know? And <laughs> uh, that, does can, that does make a difference, you know, when you're trying to arrange your life to, to make it possible to do this. Um, so let's see if we have any other couple of questions, um, you know, uh, that are coming up. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Do you take, okay. Diego Hernandez has got this question. Do you take performance into consideration when creating environments, light models, materials, optimization? Um, I imagine you do, uh, but is there anything you want to add to that? You know, besides just a yes. <laughs> so say it one more time. Sorry, I just want to make sure I so understand the, the question. The question from Diego was, do you take performance into consideration when creating your environments, uh, light models, materials, and optimization? Now, I don't know if they're, the question is geared toward the class itself, and is that <laughs> as much of a – or is that just in general for games, and do you make that constant uh, connection? 
Oh, for sure. So when I'm evaluating every student's work every week during the uh, like their feedback session, I'll always go over their their materials, their meshes, and I'll kind of be like give advice as to like, oh, hey, this mesh is using two draw calls or it's using three materials. I think there's a way we can cut this down. Here's a way we can optimize the scene a little bit further. Here's a way. Here's a way we can kind of continue to uh, add things to your scene but do it more effectively. So all the process that we talk about, including like trim sheets, tileables, all those kind of things, modularity in general, it's all ways to optimize your workflow so that you're doing the least amount of work at the most optimal uh, way possible for performance and also just for yourself. So like the you want to get the best environment with the least of our, amount of hours put in, but also making sure that it's also going to be running on any kind of machine, like whether software, you know, Unreal, uh, you know, or whatnot. That's cool. Excellent. Um, let's see. What's another question that we got here? Um, all right. Um, yes, uh, I guess the uh, <laughs> do you know what your schedule is going to be this year? <laughs> that was one question for Chris Pierce. I guess he's trying to decide when he's going to line up. How do you think your class is going to run? Sure. So it actually runs four quarters every year. So I run it every quarter. So if you miss one quarter, it's okay. It comes up the next quarter. It's no big deal. Uh, again, I, I do it the same kind of process. So this will be this, like I said, this next quarter will be the, the kind of re, uh, uh, rejuvenation of the class with a bunch of new content and a bunch of like more up-to-date content. Um, but that will be continuing on for the next year as we kind of continue to like more and more tech becomes more popular or something comes up, I'll continue to add those to the class as well. Um, and I believe it's up to a year after you've taken the class, you can come back to revisit the content uh, to, to kind of get like a refresher if you forget anything. Yeah, that's great news, especially, you know, when you want to refer back to stuff you've learned just for a refresher. So um, the question here from Stefan Aliki, how does Marmoset fit into your pipeline and what benefit does it have for baking over something like Substance Painter? Sure. Yeah. So this is a pretty common question as well, too. So um, I, the reason why I like Marmoset is because it does surface and geo normals. And what that means is that basically you have two types of normal bakes. And a lot of people don't know this. They think, oh, a normal is a normal. I baked a normal. What's what's the difference? And it actually will make a big difference as to the quality as to how it works. And so with Marmoset, you actually get the best of both and you can actually paint together the two uh, dynamically in, in the actual Marmoset viewer. Um, and that's one of the, my favorite features of it as well, is that you can kind of also, you can also see the cage itself while you're working on that. Uh, that's another pro, uh, among other things. Like I would just say like the quality, the speed um, and the, the, the general pipeline for using Marmoset is super quick. And that's not to say that I don't, I, I use Painter as well, right after I use Marmoset. But what I do is I essentially use that as my baker, I get my textures out and I bring that into substance and I continue forward texturing from there. Okay. I just got a personal question just because I was thinking about it back in the days uh, when I was uh, working on the Tiger Woods game. And back then we were dreaming about real-time displacement uh, and we couldn't make it run at frame rate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I imagine we've made a lot of, um, I guess, strides in that direction. Is that still sort of a holy grail get, or is that like starting to become more normal uh, in a lot of game engines, you know, not only including in real, but you know, there are other game engines as well that are out there. Sure, yeah. So uh, I would say definitely like Marmoset, Substance Painter, you can you can visualize that without an issue. I would say Unreal, definitely. Yeah, I would say not everything you're seeing can obviously be displaced, but I would say like it's a vast majority of most landscapes nowadays. Um, anything that really needs a lot of like heavy displacement is definitely displaced within the game. So I would say there's been multiple times, whether working on Gears or, you know, any kind of other game I've worked on, there's been times where like, oh, this asset would look really great for a cinematic if it was displaced or the landscape would yeah. look really great if it was displaced. And we definitely push that for sure. Cool. Um, we got a couple of more questions here. Uh, oh, we're at 5.37. We're actually over time. But uh, you know what? I think uh, with everything that we ran into, let's give a couple of more questions. Oh, yeah. No, I don't mind yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. We were talking about um, – doo -doo -doo. just wanted to make sure we're getting some real questions here. Uh do you get into LOD groups in the class, vertex painting and advanced material creation, creation in Unreal? So, um, yeah, so we do talk about materials. We'd go over, uh, we have actually two weeks of that. So we'll actually start you out with the kind of basics materials, understanding how that process works. And then the second week, we'll actually go into more advanced material. We'll talk about vertex painting, we'll talk about uh, subsurface scattering. We talk about like pretty much anything you could do with the material. We'll go over it. We'll talk about glass materials. We talk about like decals, we talk about all those kind of things. Um, and I actually have a sample uh, uh, Unreal package that I give everyone in, the ex in that week that they can use as an example to see like, oh, here's how I made it. You can kind of use the same kind of process or flow to understand that as well. Um, LODs, yes, we definitely talk about with meshes. We understand how that will work in the class as well. Um, and I think, was there one other one as well? 
Yeah, I think uh, there was. Um, yeah, how to, uh, this is uh, Kevin Mills. He's asking, how difficult is it to switch from film industry pipeline to game industry pipeline? Do you find that maybe people who come from a game background uh, have to overcome certain maybe things they were used to doing uh, with their old way of working compared to new? I would say we've actually had a lot of people that came from film that take the class that really enjoy it, that come out on the other side, like really, really well off. I think the, the biggest struggles they typically will have will be like, oh, how do I apply materials and how do I keep them optimized? And then also, how do I make my poly counts low? So a lot of people will start creating an asset and they'll be like, oh, this chair is 20,000 polys. And I'm like, that's pretty good, but I think we can get it lower. And here's how. And I'll usually do like a live demo in the in the feedback session as to like, oh, here's me optimizing the chair as to how we can get a little bit lower so that you can rebake this out and get a better result at a much more optimized cost. Cool. Excellent. I saw a question about Blender as well, too, talking about um, if that's used. So one thing I do is I personally use Maya, but I, I have tons of people that use Max, uh, Moto, Blender. And I think it's really important that you use whatever tool best fits you. And that's one thing I try to teach throughout the class. Is I try to make it sure it's like very theory based so that you're not just like constricted to like, oh, here's how you do that one thing in Maya. It's like, oh, I could do this exact same thing in any tool. Here's just the process of what I'm talking about of how you emulate that, that kind of design process. Okay. There was a question about the, the software as far as uh, being able to access it for either student pricing or free. Is most of the software that you're asking students to use in your class available and accessible to some degree? I know ZBrush has sort of moved to finally a subscription, so that makes it, I guess, a little bit easier. Uh, for a while, it, the pricing even there was a little weird, but Maya's free for students. Yep. And I know if you go through CGMA, you can do it. I know Unreal's free. Um, but are there any other uh, concerns on that line? Yeah, so I would say uh, Marmoset does cost. I believe it's uh, $99 for just a, it's an infinite subscription. You just get it forever. It's like once you buy it. Uh, I do know if it's something that you're interested in and you're trying to save up for the class or you're trying to like kind of figure out how you're going to pay for things. I do know at, at Thanksgiving and like Black Friday and a bunch of other times during the year, Marmoset will have huge sales where they'll have like half off. Um, I do know uh, Painter's a subscription fee. You can do, I think it's like a $9.99 or $19.99 a month. And so even if you just want to learn it for the class, you can just sign up for like two months of it. And so just pay the two, two months of subscription and then cancel it if you're not into it. Um, and then everything else is pretty much free. So you can get a, you can get a student version of Maya to use in the class. Uh, you can use Blender, which is completely free. Yeah, Unreal is free as well. So yeah, no issues there. And then I, I think I want to kind of end off on just this list, uh, President. It was one more question. Um, it says, how much feedback am I going to get as a student? That was from Richard Prattley. You know. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, as a student, uh, so each week you'll submit your assignment and you basically, that's your, that's your time to ask like any questions that is very specific to you. So if it's like, oh, here's my, here's my assignment. I'm not quite sure how to make this material or I'm struggling with this thing. Or could you take a look at this and can you give me some feedback on it? Or here's just my general assignment. Just tell me what you think. Those are the time where I give, it's a, it's a, about 10 minutes or five to 10 minutes of, uh, of, of direct feedback directly for you. And then each week we have one hour of Q and A. And that's where basically everyone piles into the room. And then I allow anyone to ask any kind of questions they want. So that could be anything from industry. Like how, how do I get a job? How do I do my resume? What kind of portfolios are like, is people looking at? Like, how do I do, how do I do this in a scene? How do I make glass shaders? How do I do this? Like pretty much any question you want to know that I, that, that we think would be best applicable to everyone to learn that we, we put you in that, to that Q and A and I answer those on the spot right there. That's excellent. That's really, really exciting. So guys, I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that uh, again, if you're thinking about taking this class, uh, you know, we do have this special offer. If you guys haven't already tried to avail yourself of that, uh, you know, it's the first 15 uh, students who uh, sign up for the course get 10% off Clinton's amazing opportunity to really kind of step your game up uh, for environment art. Um, anyway, I just... I just want to thank you personally, Clinton. Um, this was an amazing, like, 60 minutes. I know we ran into a little bit of an <laughs> issue. Uh, but, you know, you always got to be able to roll with the punches. And, uh, totally. you know, nothing like a power outage that kind of really kind of <laughs> make you realize how vulnerable we are um, in this uh, virtual uh, scenario that we're in. But even so, uh, we were able to get around it. And thank you for finding a way to get back online and, and really being there for our students. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we are just thrilled to have you. And uh, just I want to, on behalf of CGMA, uh, thank you for this past hour, for sharing your background, a little bit of workflow insights on the process related to environment art and working in Unreal for Games. And for the attendees, I want to thank you for being a part of this experience to bring your enthusiasm and questions for this subject matter. Um, again, as a part of thank you, if you haven't already done so, 
Uh, first 15 students use the discount code. Take advantage of our 10% discount for Clinton's Next Level Environment Art with Unreal class. And that's currently posted in our chat area. And I've also put it up and pinned it in the chat as well. So definitely sign up for this amazing opportunity. On behalf of CGMA, my name is Frank Cordero. It was a pleasure to host this webinar with Clinton. Thank you and signing off. Take care, guys. Adios.